Okay, our next speaker is ready and is already on standby. From the Malaysian Plastics Manufacturers Association, um, the sustainability chair who is going to share with us the industry's perspective. Please join me to welcome CY Wee. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is CY Wee, and uh, I represent the Malaysian Plastics Manufacturers Association, uh, and I'm from the Sustainability Subcommittee Group. Um, a little bit about MPMA, the Malaysian Plastics, Malaysian, uh, Malaysian Plastics Manufacturers Association. We are a 50-year-old progressive uh, trade association, uh, mainly made up of producers of plastics as well as um, the petrochemical, the resin producers. Um, we provide the leadership and uh, services to our uh, members uh, and we represent the members in uh, negotiations with uh, the government so and we make sure that the plastic industries grow in tandem with the demand uh, of course in recent years with the environmental issue around the world and uh, plastics being very high on the watch list. So we have also come up with many ways and uh, trying to make sure that our members right now is not only busy producing plastics, but also producing plastics in a responsible way with added responsibility of advising the brand owners when uh, they come up with something new in terms of uh, whether it's packaging or uh, plastic components. So today, we are all looking at how to reduce, reuse, recycle, recover, and replace. In the plastics industries, we would like to think about replace in terms of, for example, replacing plastics that is not recyclable at this moment to plastics that is recyclable, okay? So it doesn't have to be just plastics to glass or plastics to paper. It can also be plastics to another plastics that can be handled, especially in the local context in Malaysia. So, as we hear many speakers this morning, we really cannot run away from using plastics in our daily life. It's a choice material. It is also our choice to make sure that the end life of the plastics that we dispose is being disposed in a manner that is environmentally responsible. So, my first question to everyone here is, you don't have to answer, but we need to ask ourselves whether we are doing a waste separation at home. Right. So, give it a thought. If you have not done it, then maybe you should take this very basic action. If we are to tell people about circularity, it has to come from every one of us in this room first, right? So in Malaysia, we have right now, you must have heard it yesterday from the minister, uh, we are going to have our Malaysia Plastic Pack, which is a spin-off from the UK Plastic Pack. This will be led by uh, the UK Plastic Pack and the UK Plastic Pack it's about new plastics economy new plastics economy it's a 18 page directive okay uh, it can be also what I would call in a simplistic term a compass for the plastic industries as well as the brand owners and other stakeholders 
that somehow is in this plastic loop. So the next request is, if any one of you that is involved in plastics in any way, you should by now have this 18-page new plastics economy. If you do not have, you can Google and, or you can contact MPMA for it. It's a very easy, simple, 18-page new plastics economy. It gives the world a direction of where we should be going. It may not answer all our problem at this moment, but there is a direction. So, for MPMA, the important thing is we have to do something um, in a concerted manner. If you think of circular economy for plastics, you may have one way of thinking. Another person may have another way of thinking. We are saying that we are all doing circular, but is this applicable in Malaysia? You may think that in somewhere in UK, this is the circularity, but in Malaysian context, it is not, because what technology is available here may not be the same in UK. So at least this new plastics economy encourages us to be aligned. We are circular and we have to be aligned. We have to be in one full circle rather than many different circles, right? So the new plastics economy, um, uh, these are the core partners. Uh, there are more, but these are some of the core partners. The three things that it says, eliminate all problematic and unnecessary plastic items. So the brand owners will have to look into this. The plastic producer's role is also the same. Looking at each plastic that we are producing right now for our customers and ask ourselves, is this necessary? Can we lower the weight? Can we lower the thickness? Can we use less? We need to innovate to ensure that the plastics we do, we do need are recyclable, reusable, or compostable. This is very important. Three things you need to remember. From now onwards, we are telling our, our members to focus on these three. Every time we produce something, we hope the product that we produce meets one of these three. Reusable or recyclable or compostable. However, in the Malaysian context, okay, compostable is still a big question because we know that we don't separate our organic waste and that composting facility is not part of our waste management equation yet. So, for the time being, all the biodegradable bags that you are getting will still end up in the landfill. So, coming to here, I wish to highlight that there is a difference between making yourself or your company look good and actually doing good, right? So many, many people or many organizations say, that, oh, we are using biodegradable plastics. But in the Malaysian context, there isn't a way to retrieve the biodegradable plastics and put it into the composting facility where it is made, uh, where the biodegradability can take place. So in that context, the plastics, the biodegradable plastics will still end up in the landfill and it will be the same as the normal plastics. So money has been invested in the beginning, but at the end, you, we did not resolve, we didn't reduce the plastics in the landfill. Biodegradable or compostable plastics need a composting facility. 
to do its job. You cannot treat it as a banana peel where, you know, it will biodegrade by itself. It will not work, okay? And number three is uh, we circulate all plastics to make sure that we keep it out from the environment. So a few things that is mentioned in the new plastics economy, some of it I, I spoke about just now. Um, if you are already producing a plastic bag that is recyclable or a plastic component that is recyclable or reusable or compostable, then what do we do? We just uh, sit down there and uh, shake our leg? No. You are supposed to go for the next target that says, can you use a post-consumer content in your product? So that is the next challenge. So the new plastic economy asks that we think about this and not stop at here, right? This is the new plastic uh, pack, uh, the Malaysian plastic pack. So we are going to be part of this world uh, organization. Five main players in the plastics industries that has to work together, which at this moment, we are, I, I'm honest to say that we are still trying, okay? So the first is the resin producers, the manufacturers of plastic parts, the brand owners. One, two, and three has been talking all the while. And uh, traditionally, we always talk about what's the next new plastics that can do more wonders, you know? But moving forward, we will be talking about what's the next new plastics that can do more wonders, not to the product or to increase our market share, but on the economy, right? The number four and five is traditionally out from the link, okay? So moving forward, we have to strengthen that linkage with the retailers and with the recyclers. Because whatever we churn out, requested by the brand owners, we have to make sure that it can be recycled in Malaysia if the product is going to be used and end up in the Malaysian uh, landfill. If it is overseas, then we too have the responsibility to make sure that that can be recycled in wherever it will end up. So that is the newfound responsibility for the producers, right? And for this group of people. So just to update you what we have done so far in Malaysia, Petronas, our, rais our biggest raisin supplier in Malaysia, um, they have gone, signed an MOU to study the possibility of bringing plastic energy to Malaysia. Plastic energy will take up, in a very simplistic term, take up all the uh, post-consumer waste and turn it back into oil. And the oil is further, will be further cracked and uh, make new raisins. Um, a brand owner will make their product recyclable, which is at this moment not recyclable. Uh, more important thing, the MPMA and MPRA, the Malaysian Plastics Recycling Recyclers Association, we have come up with a white paper to upgrade our recycling facility and uh, to increase our collection in Malaysia. What we need to do next is very basic. This cannot happen anymore in Malaysia, but it is happening. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, who is supposed to provide the leadership for here? This is something I want to open up to, you know, to everybody. Whose responsibility is this? Okay, look at this. We have this, but if you... Is everything recyclable? If you look at here, this is contaminated. Is this recyclable? 
So if, if this is being displayed, where is the garbage? Where is the rubbish? Right? So things like that in Malaysia, we need to standardize. Okay? If we are going to offer a separation bin, we need to standardize. Whether it's four or it's just three. And what can be recycled? This is something I found in the airport. In the very big, to tell all the, all the visitors that land in an airport, you know, that particular area, what can be recycled? Very clearly written. No wordings, just photos. So that you are familiar as you step into this new city, or this uh, new city to me, okay? What goes into what bin? And here you can say there's only two bins. We already have three, which is good. But we need to improvise this. We need to standardize this so that every one of us look at the same thing. Everywhere we go, we know what to throw and to throw where. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Just when people say that, I have been asked many times this question, the first one, but I continue to tell everyone that we do our part to separate because you and I didn't know you, okay, you see that the truck mix it together, but I know that along the way, things get sent to the recyclers separately, right? So, we don't worry about what happened next. There will be authority to take care of that, but we do our part as Malaysian to separate, right? And, okay, if you want, you can take a photo and send it to the, to the people in charge, you know, your municipality or whatever, and, and launch a complaint. But please do not let that discourage you from separating. Right? So you continue to do the separation. Whether they mix it in the truck, I think we just have to leave that aside first. Right? Okay. 2025 is just a target. It's just like our 2020. We had 20 years, but what happened, right? Same thing. So 2025 is just a target. Um, just like the earlier speaker said, this is a journey. This is not a destination. Even when we reach 2025, there will be new technology. So things may change again, right? What is recyclable now? may be compostable next time. Or what is not recyclable now may be recyclable only by then because we just need to change the product, one product at a time. Okay, very good. The next six months, I would say that we will work very closely with our own, within ourselves, especially now that we have a Malaysian Plastics Recyclers Association. We ourselves need to know between the right hand and the left hand, the producers and the recyclers. We need to know what is recyclable by the recyclers so that the producers can inform the brand owners, okay? what is recyclable and what is not recyclable yet in Malaysia. Right? So that the circular economy can slowly build up from the ground. But this is going to be a long journey, like I said. It's not about the destination, it's about the progress. So, if you are the brand owners uh, or the bankers, because uh, recently, I, I just understand that the bankers also use a lot of uh, materials and, you know, and some of the materials are not recyclable. So that is, we will have to tackle one at a time. Okay? All right, I hope I answer your questions. Thank you.
Now, up next, ladies and gentlemen, is my pleasure to introduce Nirmala Turai, Executive Director, Group Corporate Affairs of Nestle Malaysia Berhad. She's going to talk to us about the brand owner's perspective in all this. Let's give a nice warm welcome, Nirmala Turai, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to see almost a full house here. Very good uh, attendance on a topic that I think everybody is interested in today and it's plastics. So I'm here from Nestle, a name that you are familiar with, and uh, I think most of you will have at least one product in your house from, from Nestle. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about plastics and our journey in plastics from a brand owner's perspective. Um, Nestle Malaysia has been in Malaysia since 1912, so we've been here for more than 100 years, and we have more than 500 products, most of which are produced from our six factories that we have in this country. So, yes, we produce a lot of products, and clearly, plastic packaging is something that we use across our um, output. Okay. Most of you would recognize these brands, uh, and you can see it's quite a wide range of brands. Now, in Nestle Malaysia, in Nestle, not just Nestle Malaysia, but in Nestle across the world, uh, we believe that we have a responsibility to support people having a positive quality of life, and we would like to contribute to them having a healthier future. And the fundamental principle that we like to practice is respect. In this case, when we talk about plastics, we have to talk about respect for the environment, respect for our consumers. These two things are very, very important to us. Now, we've made a global commitment to packaging. Before I tell, talk to you about the plastics that we use, let me tell you that we have a global commitment to packaging and our vision is that eventually none of our packaging ends up in landfill or as litter. And our ambition is to be 100% recyclable or reusable by 2025. So you look at it and say, oh yeah, this is the global vision. I'm sure in Malaysia we are way, way behind and we're not doing anything. Is that true? Okay? But the first question, before I even tell you what we're doing is, why can't we stop using plastics today? A lot of people tell us, just stop using it. You don't need it. Use something else. When we do food manufacturing, does anyone here from the food industry? Food safety is of paramount importance. Even as, late, as recently as a few days ago, you heard about a major food poisoning incident. Food is very, very sensitive. Right? Lots of microbes, spoilage, um, food travels many miles across the country where we transport it, not always in the best conditions, not always in refrigerated trucks. So food safety is very, very important. And it becomes very important to have packaging that can protect the food so that we can protect our consumers. We do baby food, right? You do not want your babies to be affected because we decided that we will pack products in unsafe packaging. So we have a challenge. We need to offer safe products, well packaged to our consumers. At the same time, we should be responsible manufacturers and take care of the planet in which we live in. Okay, globally, as part of our commitment, we have set up a Nestle Institute of Packaging Science which is dedicated to the development of functional, safe, and environmentally friendly packaging solutions to accelerate our sustainability agenda. Again, really nice. Up in Switzerland, in the mountains, lots of nice things happening, lots of good ideas, lots of good initiatives. What then happens in Malaysia? Before the current uh, excitement, I would say, on plastics, we have already started this journey. And as you can see, I'm not sure that this is working, okay. As early as April 2013, 
we started our journey to achieve zero landfill status, zero waste to landfill. So that's a long time ago before anybody started talking about responsibly disposing of materials. We first started in June 2013 to impose this target. We talked about targets. It's important to have targets because targets means we have a journey, we have a commitment, we have an end goal. And I'm very proud to say in January 2017, all our factories, by January 2017, all our factories have achieved zero waste to landfill status. And this is an audited uh, report. So you know that it's something that has been done and checked and confirmed that we do this. And it took us four years. It's not so easy. It's not something that we say, tomorrow morning we're going to have zero waste and it happens. Again, it's hard work. Okay. So what have we committed to do in Malaysia? As with our global objective, we have a commitment that all packaging, all our packaging in Malaysia is designed to be recycled by 2025. We say designed to be recycled because we do have the big question of what will consumers do with it? Will they recycle it? But we have to start by offering you products that can be recycled. Because you can have a commitment to recycle, but if the product is not recyclable or designed for recycling, it's not going to happen. We have to simplify our packaging because multi-layer packaging is very hard to recycle. At this moment, and then we need to reduce plastic usage in packaging. Even this is not as easy as it sounds. When we start using thinner packaging, using less packaging, this is Malaysia, this is the tropics, what happens? You have a lot of little friends who say, okay, it's very easy to get into a pack of Nestle product now. I have food. But that's not what we want, right? We still want our packaging to be safe. So we need to achieve less packaging, but still keep the product safe for our consumers. And of course, finally, we need to increase recycled plastic in our packaging. So where are we on this journey? This is what you want to know, right? So, sorry. Oops. In terms of design for recycling, I'm really happy to say that two-thirds of our packaging is already designed for recycling. And if you think of the huge amount of packaging that we use, to be able to say two-thirds are already ready for recycling, it's something that we are very proud of. Now, we have a target of 2025. What is stopping us with the balance one-third? Why can't we do it now? Unfortunately, some products, the packaging that we use, we do not have a technical solution yet. We are working very hard to find a technical solution. So in some markets, it's quite easy to go, for example, to paper packaging. In the tropics, with high humidity, if your product is hygroscopic, meaning it absorbs moisture, you cannot put it in paper packaging it won't work. So there are areas where we are looking for solutions and finding ways to, to go and achieve this 100% that we have set ourselves as a target. The second one is what we call, we want to remove undesirable plastics, negative plastics. On this journey, we have achieved 95% of our goal to remove negative, uh, what we call our negative list which is items like polystyrene and PVC. So we have replaced 6 million plastic spoons with wooden spoons in our ice cream. We've gone back to wooden spoons, which we used to have. Again, wooden spoons, for certain products, you have to be careful because it can break and it can hurt children. So even wooden spoons have to be carefully worked. There's a lot of techno technology that is required in these decisions. So it's not something that we can say, okay, tomorrow morning we go to um, wood and it's all solved. It is, the, people have to work at it. We have to ensure safety. We have to ensure that these are also uh, environment friendly. We have removed 20 million PVC capsules because PVC is very hard to recycle. That has been removed. And then we want to reduce plastic. You, many of you may have seen the announcement. We have just announced that we will be removing plastic straws from our UHD drinks 
starting with the 125 mil packs from December this year, with, and we will replace it with paper straws. Again, something that looks very easy, but has taken quite a while to work on and to deliver. Paper straws get soggy. Paper straws cannot bend. So, very simple. How do we get a paper straw to bend? How do we make sure that the thickness of the paper straw is enough to make sure that it doesn't get soggy in your drink? So, these are the technical challenges that have been worked on. And it's still a journey. There's still, there's still things that need to happen here. But at least we are moving in the right direction. So, these are some of the products that we already have. Sorry. Going too fast. Okay. Um, Milo 3-in-1, outer bag wrappers, vanilla ice cream, the polystyrene has been changed to PP. Maggie is 100% recyclable. Hot Cup, almost 100% recyclable. Nescafe, outer packaging, 100% recyclable. These are big brands. These are big volumes. And the team is very proud of the work that has been done. Okay. So we are the first to introduce paper straws for Milo UHD. And we hope to remove 40 million plastic straws from going to landfills. Okay, why is this a big deal? Because it's effective and scalable. And as I have been saying to you, it meets our product quality standards for the safety of consumers. It remains sturdy when used. And very important, we had to work with suppliers who were capable of meeting our rigorous standards at the quantities for high volume production, right? Because your factory equipment has to be deal has to be able to deal at with very high speed lines with this packaging. Now, an important learning that we had and we were working on all the projects that we've been working on, this cannot be done by our friends in technical alone. This cannot be done just by production. To make these projects work, it is very important that the entire business works on it. The marketing teams have to work on it, procurement needs to work on it, technical needs to work on it, and we have multidisciplinary task forces that work on it. And sometimes the energy that the commercial people bring to this really makes a difference. Okay, it's not enough to be designed for recycling. We have been saying this again and again. We need a circular economy. We need to collect back. We need to recycle. This is a project, interestingly again, which started in 2012. Again, well before all the current buzz. This is a project between Nestle and Tetra Pak. And we collect UHD packs, not just Nestle packs, but any UHD packs. And we recycle it and we make roof tiles for underprivileged families. So in 2012, we collected 300,000 packs. In 2018, we collected 30 million packs. These are not small numbers, these are huge numbers. And our target is 35 million for this year. And in the last six years, we have collected 60 million packs. Yes, I like. Poison Ivy? Yes. Okay, let's go and play over there. Okay. Stop! You cannot leave your drink packs like that. Do you see the three bins? For your drink packs, you need to put it in the recycling bin properly. Oh! But before you put it into the recycling bin, you must do the flip, flap and flap. I will show you how. First, make sure you push your straw all the way in your drink pack so that it is recycled together with the drink pack. Then you flip, flap and flap. See? So easy. So that's how you do it. After you put your drink packs properly in the recycling bin, it will go to the recycling center. At the recycling center, the drink packs will be processed. They will be recycled into paper and poly L. The poly L will be made into roofing tiles. 
These roofy tiles will all come together one by one to form the roof of houses that will be used to support the community. This is the complete recycling journey of Dream Pack. Wow! So, it is very clear that we can design for recycling, but we've got to support collection. And more importantly, we've got to educate consumers. So this rather inexpensive video, you can see it's inexpensive, is designed to educate children on how to recycle. And we had an interesting exercise where we have gone zero single-use plastic in all our sites in Nestle. And what was interesting was so many good intentioned people with no idea how to recycle. But the moment we taught them how to do it, our separation, waste separation levels are really good and everyone is very, very conscious about not using uh, single-use plastic. So we are very proud that we have achieved zero single-use plastic status in our sites. Okay. We also motivate our people to go out and take part in community projects. And this one, 600 people, 5.7 tons of waste. So what are the challenges? Supplier capability, technical solutions, people capability, cost, machine capability, maintaining shelf life, and sometimes we really don't have an alternative solution, which is something that we are very open to and we are looking for solutions for some of our packaging that we don't have answers as yet. Okay? And the last part, last but not least, and really, really important, is the whole game of collecting. The, how do we contribute to the circular economy? So here we work, we have partnerships with the government, with industry, and with NGOs. And these are some of the NGOs that we work with. We are founding members of the Plastic Pact, and I personally... I'm very excited about being part of the plastic pack because for the first time, we are bringing in brand owners, retailers, government, recyclers, because that loop has to be closed so that we can all work together to contribute to addressing the issue of collection. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Okay, I will answer question two and question three uh, first. What level of management or division drives SDGs in Nestle? Okay, in theory, looking at SDGs sits with my team, which is corporate affairs. The reality is, when it comes to plastics in particular, it's, it's been an amazing journey for us. We have a team of people called the Green Gladiators. And uh, there's a steering committee, and there are more than 100 people across the organization who are part of this team who work on various solutions, who work on Keton, who work on straws, who work on transforming non-recyclable packaging to packaging, who are doing projects with retailers, who are working with the government, who are working with NGOs. So the answer to question number two is which level of management? It is the whole company. And the sponsor of this activity is the market head himself. The CEO is the sponsor. And you have people. I'm an active player. I am the director of corporate affairs. Uh, we have the technical director who is equally involved. We have one of the business managers. So we form the advisors. And then you have this whole team of people who work on it. So it cannot happen because one team in the corner is working on it. It has to be something that everybody is working on and everyone who feels passionately about it. Implementing the five R's require additional costs. Has Nestle passed this cost to its consumers? I'm happy to say no, not at the moment, right? Because at the end of the day, you have to remain competitive. You have to find solutions that are also workable. And also, you have to be responsible citizens. It's a combination of both, right? We cannot go for 
extremely expensive, complicated solutions which are meaningless if consumers cannot afford the solution. You've got to have solutions that are pragmatic, that meet your objectives, but are also affordable in cost. There is going to be investment. This investment is going to increase as the years go, as we get closer, as we contribute to recycling. We have the full support, and that is why it's important for a company like ours that there is global commitment for this. And because we have global commitment and we have the right projects, we can apply for support, we can apply for funding. But more important than that, we need solutions that are scalable and affordable. We cannot go for solutions that will die a natural death simply because no one can afford those solutions. So that's part of the equation as we develop these solutions. And what is Nestle doing about all the plastic pollution it had contributed to in the past? You know, I wish Nestle was the only company that contributed to plastic pollution in the past. Then we really have to go out and, and fix everything. Unfortunately, every single packaged industry, packaged, not just packaged food, right? Since becoming more aware of plastic, I am horrified with the amount of plastic that I'm surrounded with. Okay, contact lens solution. My solution, my holder, my this, my that. We are surrounded by plastic. You know, I think what is important is collaboration. All of us have to work to find solutions. We welcome input, we welcome feedback. Blame games don't solve problems. Collaboration, a unified approach. Like I said, Plastic Pack is amazing because it brings so many stakeholders together. And we have one goal, let's do it. Let's clean up. When we found 5.7 tons of waste at the beach cleanup, it's a very depressing thought. And you will not believe what we found along those beaches. So let's work together. It's more about what can we do? How do we fix it? And I really like what the previous speaker said. Let's do our part. That's, that's really important. Let's separate. Let's stop using single-use plastic. Let's look for things that are designed for recycling, and let's make a difference. Thank you. Now, up next, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, whose uh, title, when I first saw it, I said to myself, you got my attention. It's called Plastics Buffet, All You Can Eat. All right? Ladies and gentlemen, Ocean Recovery Alliance, the founder and plastic plasticity convener, please join me to welcome Doug Woodring. Thanks for having me today. Um, it is a plastic buffet out there. And um, you've heard a lot about this issue today, so I don't want to take you down the road of repetition, but <clears throat> hopefully there's a few things here that I'm going to talk about that are different angles and nuances that uh, might help what you're thinking about uh, with your brands and how you guys can get engaged on this issue. <clears throat> um, you know, most of you, that there's seven types of plastic, but in reality, there's more than 40,000 types that live in those seven families. Different colors, different mixes of chemicals. Most uh, companies don't even really know what those mixes are because they just tell the designer to make me a red toy that uh, does this on the shelf. And that makes it super complicated for recyclers, for recovery, for turning this material into something that does not become waste. <clears throat> what we really need to start thinking about is the freedom of putting all of our products into the world without having to pay to play for that freedom. To date, we've been able to do it freely. Products go out, and there's not a real cost associated with the ramifications of that material and the waste that comes back. So the world's starting to change. You heard yesterday about uh, consumers who are much more aware of uh, the products that they go in and buy and that they have more control of the space. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in a lot of the world, this is the norm. So when you hear people say, we need more education, we need more education, the problem is the teachers in many of these places grew up in this. And so you have to teach the teachers to start teaching in a different way because for them, this is the normal way that they grew up with. And so just the challenge of getting education through the system with people who feel it in their heart and their head is different than just 
assuming you can get into a school and tell all the kids that you have to recycle with a blue or green bin. <clears throat> Climate change is a super big issue, but I would argue that plastic pollution impacts people daily more than climate change does right now. Does not mean it is necessarily bigger or stronger, but it impacts water quality, health, fishing, tourism, agriculture, animals, all of these things every single day across many, many countries of the world because they don't have the capacities to handle the waste. How much do we make in a year? 10 meters worth of garbage if the whole world was gonna add their municipal solid waste together would cover Japan. If you look at the estimates of population growth, if you believe those estimates that the population will grow a lot in the next two decades and people will consume more, eat more, uh, buy more, they have more spending power, then we would cover France, New Z uh, Spain, New Zealand, and Japan with 10 meters of waste. And almost no country today has the capacity to handle that. So in some ways, it's a huge opportunity because of course there are gonna be technologies that come that can turn it to fuel, chemical recycling, construction material, asphalt, new tables, new products, but that's hopefully why some of you are here today to see how some of your brands can be leading in this space. You, we've seen charts like this before, but the real reason we have a big pol pollution issue is because down here is the amount of money put into recycling and waste infrastructure in the last decades, which as you heard before uh, earlier today, does not by any means uh, complement the amount of production in material use that we have. So there's, there's not really any Elon Musks in this space because plastic and pollution and waste is not a sexy topic. Today it's a bit sexier than it was a year ago, but it's not where the innovators are going and not where you're seeing huge amounts of venture capital money and all kind of things yet. Hopefully that might start changing. <clears throat> Why do we have a lot of waste in the world? Because there's a huge amount of unsound disposal. What this graph shows you is the richer the country you are per capita, the more chances you have of having trucks and recycling bins and pickup recovery capacities but most of the countries of the world don't have that. And it doesn't mean the consumers don't want to recycle. It doesn't mean that the companies don't want to recycle. It doesn't mean the governments don't even want to do a good thing, but they don't either have the money or they haven't built that infrastructure because there's been other things they had to do. <clears throat> this is one issue that almost no one talks about at any of these events, is the burning of the garbage. Of course, once it's burned, it's gone. But up to 40% of the world's garbage is burned this way, not in an incinerator, not in a big factory, not in a cement kiln, but like this. And this causes three big issues. It's uh, immediate respiratory issues if you're near that smoke. <coughs> Carbon black, which is just uh, one of the largest uh, issue uh, impacts on climate change because the soot is, uh, absorbs heat. And also the toxicity of all this plastic when it's burnt goes into this, the, rain, the rain in the rivers, creeks, and the, and the ocean. And that's what gets into our food stream when that gets into the ecosystem. So uh, having a system that fixes the waste and uh, takes this out of the equation is already a giant step forward if we can do that. <clears throat> this is uh, resilient, the resilient band-aid, we call it. <clears throat> and that's because Plastic is super resilient as a material. With climate change, we're trying to build resilience. Most people just think of the ocean and they think of building a seawall, building a higher uh, foundation for the building so you don't get flooded. They're not always thinking about big floods, big rains. Do the storm drains clog up? Does the pollution go out into the water, make the water not usable? Then the people have much more to deal with as a resilient community. So when you have unsound waste disposal and a lack of capacity for waste management in this band where you have hurricanes, typhoons, black rain, uh, monsoons, all of these weather events which may or may not come with climate change increasingly, 
you know, this is where we really need to be focusing. And it's not just Asia. It is Latin America, India, US, even Europe has these issues. But of course, this is the zone where the waste management is not quite so good. <clears throat> this is a chart that we made recently uh, just to get people thinking about the shipment of air. Because with rigid plastics, if you do not compress it, which most people do not, when they put it into a bin, you basically have air covered with plastic as a waste product. And that takes up eight, six to eight times more space than compressed ground material. So if you're moving plastic bottles around a city or a town, one ton on a truck might be 45,000 bottles and it might be worth about 500 US dollars in a market if the quality of that recycle is good. But if you had a grinder, a simple grinder, or a shredder or a compactor in that community, you could fit nine times more the amount of material on that truck. That's worth $4,500 now and 350,000 bottles. And nine trucks less on the road and less bad diesel because most of those trucks are poor quality, bad for the roads, bad for the tires. And we don't even talk about this issue. One of the biggest things we could be offering to most of the communities around the world is simply grinders, shredders, and capacity for them to get their material into the recycling stream. So some of the uh, challenges with recycling, you cannot do it without volume and quality. And the quality comes when you, at the very beginning of the sorting system in our cities. We heard a little bit about the bins. I was at the airport. Uh, a couple days ago when I got here, there was nice that they had all the recycling bins, but they had not one garbage bin. So it was, there was no place to put stuff that I view as unrecyclable. And most people like me, maybe not me, they would say, well, there's a bin, it looks like garbage, I'm putting my stuff in it. And that immediately contaminates these batches. And the problem is the cost of Sorting all this is what drives the problem, the real cost of recycling. Collection is not recycling. People think that because they're putting something in the bin, that is the end of their life, and they've now recycled the product. That is only the beginning, and if you don't collect it the right way, then you're not able to get the materials out and be able to use it. And we are promoting simply sorting uh, collections by wet and dry. Because if you take all your materials into a dry environment, anyone who's hand sorting or other types of sorting are much able to get value out of that rather than mixing it together with something wet, which is organic. Water processing, no one talks about this. One of the reasons a lot of the recycling factories get shut down is because they do not pay and they don't have the ability to pay for water processing machinery. Some of the water processing machinery is too big. Literally, the machines are too big for a lot of the recyclers' smaller shops and factories. So the government comes along and says, wow, that looks like a horrible processing recycling place because the water is going out. But you've got to clean it because the sorting and the collection was bad at the beginning. So when this stuff goes out, the government says, oh, this is bad, recycling, that. you've got to shut that down. We're then creating a much bigger problem, maybe which is solvable just because they could have had better water processing technology at, the, at that facility. So that's just something to think about for the entrepreneurs and people out there in this space. The circular economy has a lot of money embedded in it. If you look at just the packaging waste in the US alone, paper, glass, metal, Plastic is worth about $8 billion estimate, $8 billion just in the waste stream of packaging in the US. 80% of material value of this stuff goes into landfills in the US and is not getting captured. So that's a big opportunity. <clears throat> Why do we have some issues today? Is it partly because we have a lack of rules and incentives on standardization of material, it's free to use this, and the retailers are not being held 
uh, accountable or they don't feel the consumers are doing enough to um, make their voice known that they want to, uh, to do something more sustainable. So we talked a little bit yesterday about uh, single-use plastic. Is it simply for convenience or is it because all of these things really do have to have a package on it in order to survive on the shelf and be shipped around? This is single use, but it, is, it really is necessary for that product. Can you design away single use? Design, again, may depend on the needs for the product, but if you're talking about the marketing value of the way it's packaged, you can see a lot of things that are packaged that do not need to be packaged that way in order to sell the functionality of that good. And so it might not just be the designers that have to help out, it might be the marketers and the way that we think of, of packaging this product. <clears throat> Unfortunately, a lot of uh, companies, I'm talking more from a Western standpoint now, US and Europe, hollowed out their economies by putting a lot of manufacturing into other countries. A lot of the products got cheaper and cheaper. Everyone, of course, the consumers like that. But when this happens, you have the, a lot of things going on at the same time. Lower wages, less manufacturing. People don't have the ability to pay for a little change in a product that might now be a bit more sustainable because we've taken it down to the cheapest level that we can. And if you look at how the US and Britain, for example, have the leaders that they do, I would almost argue that it's partly because of this manufacturing issue. So if we're talking about designs and the corporates and your role, we can't keep saying that it has to be cheap, 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 and that the consumers will not buy it if it's cheap, cheap, cheap. <clears throat> we can't keep going after the consumers just as a mass of people who we think <clears throat> are not easily, um, how do I say, that they're not awake to this issue. And when you look at early adopters in the community, maybe 10% of the people are the ones who really move first. They're the influencers. They say we've got to do things this way. The rest are the ones sort of just following. So if you're a brand and you are not offering some things to this community, of course you can sell to this crowd because <coughs> this is the crowd that is not necessarily leading the influencing on the consumption. But if we're in this room leading the way on sustainability and we're giving the choices to them and you're buying at economies of scale with these new ways that today might seem more expensive, but tomorrow they won't be more expensive, we need that kind of leadership to kick in. So I asked a question yesterday <coughs> out of this triangle of who has influence in the community. If you assume that the consumers are mostly followers, if you see that uh, many of the governments uh, don't always have the power to legislate across the board in the way that maybe the environmental community would like to see be with big changes, most of this influence comes to the brands. Brands have R&D capacity. Brands have the ability to tell a story. They have ability to make a product, get it onto a shelf, engage with the consumers, and when that happens, the consumers follow and then the government say, oh, that is possible. Those changes can be made, but we should not assume that it's an equal standing and that the blame on the consumers has the same value as, and the blame on the government has the same value as what the brands really could be doing in this case. These kind of materials, products are what I would say are um, easily marketed in a way plastic that has no functionality whatsoever in this product and its use and there's no reason why we should have <coughs> you know these things on our products if that retailer or company is talking about sustainability. These can all be recycled if the supermarket really wanted to have these on their apples, 
but if you take them off the apples at the point of the uh, loading of the, of the uh, counters, the consumer doesn't have to touch these, and then therefore they won't get distributed in the households and won't become part of the waste stream. If this then becomes a pure recyclable material, <coughs> polystyrene is very valuable if it's pure and it's all gathered at the point of retail back into a box and back into the reverse supply chain uh, to be used. So I think with that, I'm gonna end on this slide, that the new rules of success, I believe in this game, are that you do have to start thinking about pain to play and what that means is paying to play to get your products into the market. Because getting in this stadium and getting that audience, they are having more power and ability to say, yes, we want yours, or no, we don't want yours anymore. And if you're able to see beyond that and, and make these challenging choices of a little bit extra money on a package that is better to be recycled or more standardized for that, then you're going to be able to be uh, a leader in this space that would engage consumers around a product that might be plastic but might be not as uh, negatively impacting if it becomes waste in the end. So I can take questions if someone wants, uh, if, if you've got any on the, uh, on the screen. Isn't it, going, isn't it going to stress the environment more if all packaging is to be replaced with paper packaging? less trees, less oxygen. Uh, I didn't really talk about paper, um, but personally, there's many ways that you can, assuming you're not cutting down virgin forests, there's many ways that you can uh, sustainably have wood, which is uh, carbon uh, absorbing, and plenty of ways to re use recycled packaging of paper and cardboard. That material, when it's in the environment, will not last long at all, especially if it gets wet. You cannot make that argument with plastic, ever. So the life cycle analysis of plastic, which never includes the longevity of that piece of material in the environment, is never made. And you can, in my view, you can therefore never compare it with paper. <clears throat> the last one, uh, unified international body. All countries join, formulate standardized laws that each country can gazette with enforcement would this not thing, blah, blah, speed things up? Absolutely it would. The problem is there's no international body to do it. Hate to say it. <clears throat> and that is the challenge. Uh, you need to have leadership. You need to have a multilateral institution that can suggest uh, enforcement or suggest even programs for uh, EPR, extended producer responsibility, <coughs> Uh, taxes, fees, pain to play. If you were to put money on the table before you're putting a product in the market like Taiwan does, you have money then available to handle that gap that I showed you in recycling infrastructure and machinery and equipment to handle the material for its second life. So the, the, the real challenge and the opportunity here is to turn this stuff into a second life, to reincarnate it so that it's not becoming a waste, that it is becoming uh, something that we use at the front end and at the back end in some form. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on very quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Up next, here's something very interesting. The topic called Turning Waste into Ash. From uh, Pamarai Sindriam Brahat, here's the Executive Director, Pang Sui Lei. The previous speaker, Mr. Woodring, mentioned that there's no Elon Musk in this space. Um, let me just allow me to share with an Elon Musk worthy technology and solution in this space. Well, it's ha I believe it has been a long day for you um, since the organizer has allocated only 15 minutes to me. And for me, a good presentation and a speech, it's very much the same as checking out a girl wearing a short miniskirt. Long enough to cover the vital parts, but short enough to capture your attention. So now that I have your attention, let's talk some trash. 
But of course, we are not talking the kind of trash about other people, not about the government, not about political parties, not about political leaders. We are not that. Or are we actually? Well, the kind of trash that we would like to talk about is the kind of trash that we created yesterday, today, tomorrow, and all the future trash. But I'm not here in the business of speaking frustrations. I'm here to talk about a solution, an ability, a superpower that I would like to share with all of you today. But first thing first, I'm not here to tell you about, to sell you a better TV or a better smartphone or a better computer or a better console or anything. I'm here to share with you an amazing technology and equipment that allows you the ability, the superpower to be, to be a hero. I believe from the previous speaker that I have spoken, this technology will make it easy for everyone. And the reason why I'm saying this is because we have read so much, we have so much statistics, we have so much issues, we have so, so much frustrations and also concerns raised, but there's no solution. And this solution that we're going to talk about is going to make it easy for everyone. The name of the equipment, the technology is called the Eco Waste Asher, and essentially it's about turning waste to ash. This is all it does. Simple as that. Many people that I spoke to, they will ask me, what else can you talk about it? Nothing. All it does is turn your waste into ash. And for every amount of volume of waste that you put through the machines, it gives you 4% of residue in the form of ash, which is inert, non-harmful, and non-hazardous. In doing so, we are using zero accelerants. There's no diesel, there's no petrol, there's no gas required to do this, simply because the technology that we are talking here does not burn. There's no fire, there's no burning, there's no combustion. In layman terms, what we are doing is just baking and drying at ultra-high temperature. It's a pyro a techn technical term will be a pyrolysis system, but it is pyrolysis is not something new. It has been around for more than 30 years now. But it's how we achieve pyrolysis is the magical part and the amazing part of this. And, and the beauty of the air share here, while I'm sure all of you have gone through a lot of technology and a lot of uh, techniques, a lot of methods that involve segregations, pre-treatment process, sorting. With the air share, you do none of that. Whatever that you receive, put it in, turns into ash. That's it. So the 4% ash that, we, that, that, we, that is produced from the ash here is non-harmful, non-hazardous, and it's in it. Um, straight away, the ash can be used as soil conditioner or as fertilizers. In the Philippines, the local municipals who are using the ash here are able to harness um, the ash um, to produce organic fertilizers. They are able to claim the ash to be organic fertilizers because of the tests they have done. And they also mix with sawdust, and also they have their own organic farms, which they have run through the vegetable for testing, and it's proven to be um, in the region, and it's classified as organic. In India, the clients, uh, the, in India, in a temple in India, Pune, which are using the Asher, um, they clean up the, the, the temples, we see the rituals there, they, they use a lot of fruits, uh, flowers, and coconuts. So the workers will clean up the temple using the Asher, and then the ash will then use to mix sand bricks, to repair the temple, as well as to make um, interlocking bricks to build walking pavements and also benches for parks. So the Asher comes in three different models, um, two-ton solar, two-and-a-half-ton electric smokeless, and a four-ton electric smokeless. Um, the two-ton solar emits 70% vapor, 30% smoke, whilst the 2.5 and four-ton electric smokeless emits 100% vapor. And all three models, fits nicely into one parking space. So I always tell people the Asher, it's about three A's. Well, we, you, we can come up with all state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, fabulous technology, but if it is not accessible, it is not available, it's not affordable, then it doesn't make sense for anyone or for any countries or government. So it's a very simple, slim, simple, compact technology. It's a very modest and humble technology, yet, it delivers what it has to deliver. So, it's a whole bunch of information here. There are 12 key, 
key takeaways that I would like you all to absorb and take back. But the most interesting thing one that I want to point out is it is a closed-loop system. The Azure comes with its own built-in filtration and water scrubber system. And in the water scrubber system, you reuse water, and the water that we use is mixed with a, specially, a special formulated solutions, high alkaline to suppress all heavy metals, dioxin, furans, and all pollutants. But the water in the system, there's no discharge. We do not allow any discharge from the system. Everything is closed loop. Everything is treated and self-cleaned within the system and reused within the system. The only discharge from the ash is just the vapor and the ash, which, is, which are both um, non-harmful, non-hazardous, and in compliance to the US EPA standards. And in terms of financial, which a lot of government, a lot of corporates, whenever I speak to them, this is the one of the things that they raise. What's the cost? What is the return on my investment? In terms of cost, you are looking at 85% cheaper than any incinerators, WTE, um, biogas, biomass plant. In terms of operational, you are easily looking at 90% cheaper because we simply do not consume any diesel, we do not consume any gas, any petrol. Um, all you, the only OPEX to the system is the maintenance of the consumable for the filtration system, which is not more than 6% of the capex cost of the ASHA. Um, electricity consumption is very, very slow for the electrical model. It's, it's the same as your 1.5 horse aircon, which is ranging between 3.5 to 4.3 kilowatt hour. And water consumption, because of the water trouble system, annual, annual consumption at Malaysian tariff, you're looking at only 20 ringgit. So, in brief, the technology. So at our demo factory, when we arrive at these slides, I can share more because um, if I dive up too much, I can put the audience into the Azure and not let them leave the factory. But here, I don't have the Azure with me, so I can't be diverging too much. Generally, the technology, the IP comprises of three main um, components, which is the plasma reactor, the refractory chamber, and the whole water scrubber system. This is IP, the IP of the system. So I mentioned there's no diesel, there's no gas, there's no petrol. The heat that is used in the heat treatment process is self-generated perpetually. For as long as there's mass, there's waste in the chamber, the heat continues to grow. Without, without any diesel, gas, or petrol, our four-ton units has clipped 1,600 degrees C without external energy, without accelerants. All we fit in is just waste. But, but in the case of the 1,600 degrees C, it was purely synthetic rubbers and plastic in the factory in China. So the, so the, 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 the combination of these three components makes it a complete closed-loop system for waste treatment. You see, in, in waste treatment process, as mentioned by many speakers before, is the pollutions that we have to control. And this is the genius part, right? This is very similar to the caustic system that you have in a vessel, in a marine cargo exhaust system. Similar, similar approach. But the solution that they use, we were able to copy that using our own formulations. Very high alkaline, 12.6 pH, together with the three layers of special carbons that we have formulated, whatever that we release from the system is in full compliance at 99.9% .9 efficiency. I give you an example. Allowable limit for dioxin is 0 0.1 mg per meter cube. Our system suppresses dioxin to the level of 0 0.014 to 0 0.0018. Carbon monoxide allowable limits 50 mg per meter cube based on US EPA standard method seven, method eight, our system releases at 0 0.2 mg per meter cube. And of course, of all the slides, this is probably the one that I'm proud of. <coughs> this is 100% developed, invented, and manufactured in Malaysia. This is an inventor himself. I'm 72 years old man. Interesting fact about him, he is not an engineer. He is not a scientist. 
he is an accountant. So accountants don't look at just numbers, you can do more. And he managed to con me to talk rubbish. I quit my high profile corporate job two years ago to join him and started talking rubbish with him. So every time he speaks to people, I managed to con. He will tell you he managed to con an engineer to talk about rubbish with him. Great man. Um, unfortunately, he's not here today with us. Uh, he has gone for a medical checkup. Probably I stress him too much on the technology as well. So now, trash to ash, 4%. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to us? This is the most realistic and definitive solution for waste, right? So this, it means we, are, we can now divert waste from landfill. We have a definitive solution, simple, practical, realistic. And when I say realistic, it's not just financial, but it's also environmental, operational, social, tactical, etc. Okay, what we have been doing with all the waste in the world you bag it from your kitchen, you bring it to the dumps, the, your rubbish bin outside your house. Someone's going to come and collect it away and then goes to the transportation and then goes to the landfill, etc. So what happens there? The only thing that I can think of, we are constantly relocating. There's no disposal, there's no treatment, there's no eliminating. We are just merely relocating. Relocating to the point that it's out of your sight, out of your mind. No one is bothered, right? I showed pictures of landfills to people. One of the person in the audience asked me, is this a real photo? Yes, this is a real photo. This is not from Marvel or Hollywood. This is a real photo. That shows how insular and how ignorant some of us are. So it means we can stop sending waste to landfills, right? And this is the photo that I mentioned about. And plastics? No problem, and the more the merrier for us. Um, plastics probably is one of the easiest ways that the Asher can take. Um, if, if the previous speaker was saying all you can eat, Asher is all you can eat. If the Asher is the client to the plastic buffet, that company is going to lose a lot of money. Right, of course, and it means with the Asher, we can start treating at source. Why are we relocating? Why are we transporting? Why are we accumulating? Why are we storing when we can take and treat at source immediately, instantaneously? And by doing that, we eliminate the needs for rodents, for vermins, for water, water treatment, for odor control. We eliminate all that. One step, one, one simple act solves all problems. So, this picture tells it all. The more the, if we were to continue the way that we are continuing, this is what is going to happen. We're going to continue to sweep under the carpet, we're going to continue to relocate and to land, send it to the landfill. The Ministry of Rural Development came to see me and the KSU told me, Pang, I'm very saddened whenever the federal government tells me Whenever there's a landfill reaching its critical capacity, the Rural Development Ministry is tasked to identify lands outside in the rural area to be converted into landfills. So I, he always tells me, he, he, he said to me, orang bandar buat taik, orang kampung kena. Right? So, but if nothing changes, then nothing changes, right? So how can we have that change? That's why I, I was, when I started, I here to tell you about a solution, not about frustration. I'm presenting to all of you, to Nestle, to any association, to any corporates, a solution that makes it easy for you to play your part, to play your role, and be a superhero, and stop sending waste to the landfill. Because all of us, can take up the responsibility now. Responsibility is two parts, response and ability. If you don't have the ability, it's difficult for you to respond. I'm availing you that ability. So it's now the time for you to respond. All of us can respond. A lot of us would like to talk about rights because we pay tax. We pay tax, government do the job lah. But we do not like, we do not like to talk about responsibility.
So I humbly invite all of you, be a hero, because all of you can be a hero. All of you can be a landfill diversion hero. And, and of course, when I speak to governments, corporates, the first thing that they talk about was the return on investment. I don't have the budget, I don't have the money. But the truth is, the money is there. What it's like is the social will and the political will. Um, most businesses would like to indulge in the fairy tales of continuous growth, uh, return of handsome, return of investment, and also personal gain. If, if that mindset doesn't change, whatever money that we have will never be enough. So, ladies and gentlemen, with the ability that I'm availing to you today, what will you do? And lastly, thank you very much. And I applaud all of you, actually. Thank you for being here because the reason why you are here is because you are fighting a good fight. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, the first question, what is preventing this technology from going out more urgently? Um, if you ask me, it's compliance and also self-inflicting, no, no, I would say self-inflicting um, compliance. You see, what are we treating? We are treating ways. Um, there are so many standards that to comply, so many regulations to comply, all that. Um, in Malaysia, particularly, we are facing some challenges with our Department of Environment to get endorsement of this new technology. Because it is a new technology, uh, we are not able to get it classified and categorized. Uh, in our deployment in Sampona, uh, we are going through a R&D phase with DOE just to get a validation of the system. But surprisingly, we are more than 60 units out of Malaysia. And out of Malaysia, these countries are one of those, and those are the, amongst those are the most stringent one than Malaysia. Singapore, China, Australia, they are using the Azure there. And our latest installation, which I can mention, but I cannot put it on paper, is Changi Airport. Changi Airport is using this. Why is not Malaysia government endorsing our own Malaysian technology? Well, I can go on with the first question. It will touch a lot of post political issues and also um, stepping on a lot of tears, which I shall not. Um, okay, for second question, how many machines have been installed in Malaysia? Um, out of Malaysia, we are more than 60 units. In Malaysia, we only have nine. When I will speak to my clients, uh, my, my clients and supporters overseas, they always say, hey, Pang, your technology is very good. How many have you installed in Malaysia? I'm kind of embarrassed, actually. Well, out of these nine, two are in Sampona, used by local municipals, five used by a private company, a, uh, a, a group of professors, JV, at Nanotech Malaysia, they use the technology to harness silica from Pedihas, Sekampadi. Apparently, they, are, they have found a method to cultivate silica. 40% uh, of every one ton of uh, Pedihas that they put through the system, they are able to cultivate 40% of silica which they can sell at five ringgit per kilo, and they have five units of that. Um, another, another one will be in Cyberjaya at the international school, uh, Rainy Bunch International School. So the school has an eco-sustainable progr education program with the kids, so they bought one, the Asher, to self-treat all the waste in the school. At the same time, the, 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 the CEO encourages the parents of the students, whenever they come and send the students, bring the waste from the home, and they treat it at the school. And the last, the latest installation is in Goping, uh, an outdoor adventure uh, company uh, that bought it, bought and invested the unit and to work with the Penghulu Kampung to clean up the village. So that's one of those are the ones in Malaysia. Um, there are three models of it. Um, I really would like to meet up with this person. <laughs> okay, there are three models of this. Um, uh, starting from a two-ton, two and a half-ton, and four-tons, is 338,000, 388,000, and 588,000. Ton-for-ton comparison with any technology that you have, it's easily 85% cheaper. Right? I repeat again, it's 338. I know it's very Chinese. 338, 388, and 588. 
<laughs> With that, thank you very much. Congrats. Thank <laughs> you.